You know, Eric Anderson, uh, when he was in communicants class, and I taught it years and years ago, was about that big. And it just is a reminder, always treat respectfully kids that are that big. Because <laughs> you never know. Someday they may be eight feet tall, you know. But he was a blessing then and he is a blessing now. So uh, anyway, how's the volume? Are we okay? Is it about right? Sounds a little hot to me, but if it's not, if it's, it's okay from you, okay, great, thank you. Well, nice to have you here. We are working through John, and uh, we're in chapter 18, which you probably know launches the last major section of John's gospel, which is what's commonly called the great events of the gospel. So we have the trial of Jesus, the crucifixion, resurrection. Very appropriate, we should be in this territory right now at the beginning of Holy Week, so uh, that just works out that way, it's kind of nice. But of course, we'll still be working on this sometime uh, to come. And just a little reminder for you who are here, and you might mention it to anyone that sometimes is here and isn't here yet or isn't here this morning. Uh, we don't meet next week. It's Easter Sunday. The week after that, we would normally meet, but I'm asking you for an excused absence because Candy and I are going to be in Tucson to witness the baptism of our two grandchildren, Stella and Jonah. And so we thought that would be a good excuse to get out of town. So it does mean we're missing one week. It kind of pains me to do that, but as it uh, turns out, at least as I have the time budgeted right now, we should still be able to finish John this year. So I think we're going to be okay. I'm having to uh, do a little bit of a sprint here toward the end. I hate to do that, but I think we'll still be okay, which means in the fall, we'll be picking up studies of the book of 1 Peter, so that is the plan. Uh, this morning, the uh, text we have before us, I'm calling, see if, I'm calling betray, Betrayal and Denial. Two great crimes committed against Jesus. One of his disciples betrayed him, the other one denied him, and we just barely get that part of the story this morning. There's more to see on that, but we'll at least see the first little piece of Peter's denial. Both of these are huge crimes. I think sometimes we think that what Judas did is worse, but actually in the great scheme of things, I don't know that you could really say that. Certainly Judas betrayed Jesus, but it was certainly hypothetically possible that later Judas could repent, could have come back, could have been the leader of the band. You know, I mean, it could have turned out that way. As it turns out, it was Peter who denied him. And the synoptics tell us that before the denial was over, he was calling down curses on his head, denying that he ever knew that man. And then when it came thundering home to him what he had done, he went out and wept bitterly. It could have been the story that Peter was the one who was lost, went out and hung himself. It could have happened that way, couldn't it? Now we know the difference at least in terms of what we see from, this, from the gospel accounts, is that Jesus said to Peter, I have prayed for you, that your faith fail not. There's no record of him saying that to Judas. It does speak to the fact that God is sovereign, that God is accomplishing what he wants to accomplish, sometimes through unwitting servants, and something of that we see in the story here. But I also think it teaches us just a little kind of side thought about this. Something of Peter. Peter was full of bravado. He was gonna fight for Jesus. He was, we'll see it today in, this, in the material we cover. He pulls out a sword. He's gonna go to battle for Jesus. He's willing to die on the battlefield. You know, that's pretty impressive. And yet it was useless. Jesus told him, put away your sword, man. This is not the way it's going to be done. Peter thought he had forfeited everything. He thought he had forfeited every possible claim to be qualified, not only not to be a leader, to even be a disciple. That's what he thought. He thought it was over, kaput. And yet, from God's point of view, it wasn't until that colossal failure that Peter really was qualified, you see. 
We don't serve Jesus out of the gumption of our own psychological momentum. That's not the stuff of which discipleship is made. Peter had to hit rock bottom, be broken, and feel like he was an utter failure, and then he was qualified to be a great apostle, but not until then. It's true of all of us. There is a rock bottom we all have to hit, which is what finally teaches us now, by God's grace, we can do what we can never do when it was just puffed up with our own ego, you know. And it just heard, occurred to me this morning, driving in, that's a point we ought to make. So I'm just throwing it in here for free in advance, even though it's not part of the lesson, you know, but I thought, let's just notice that about these two guys. We have a betrayal and denial, and uh, we want to take a look at both of those. So anyway, uh, the text we're going to cover is the first 18 verses of uh, John chapter 18. And uh, the first paragraph goes like this. This is the word of God. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley, where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas, having procured a band of soldiers and some officers and the chief priests, of the scribes, or I'm sorry, officers from the chief priests and the Pharisees went there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, went forward and said to them, um, who are you folks seeking? And they answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus said to them, ego eimi. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. And when Jesus said, Ego eimi, they drew back and fell to the ground. Whew. What a moment. Let's, uh, let's have a word of prayer and we'll get going. Father, we are grateful for the great events that took place in this holy week. On the one hand, we feel the anguish, we can imagine the turmoil that filled the hearts of the disciples as they saw events that seemed to tell them everything was lost. And yet now from our vantage point we can see that it was by that means that everything was gained. We thank you for these lessons. We pray that our brief reflection on this moment in the drama would be illumined to us through your spirit. In the name of Jesus, we ask these things, amen. amen. Well, uh, John doesn't tell us the name Gethsemane, but I think you know that was a place where they commonly hung out. It's the word Geth Shami, means oil press, which probably describes some of the industry that went on in that region. John also omits some other details. He doesn't tell us about Jesus going off and praying, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. He doesn't tell us about Jesus finding the disciples sleeping. He knows that we know that. And as we've pointed out number, as a, numbers of times along the way, John isn't trying to just repeat what he knows we know. He wants to fill in the gaps that we don't know. And so we read John against the backdrop of the synoptic narrative. And then we can kind of add in these little insights. And this is something the synoptics don't cover. So John wants to make sure we don't miss it. And that is that uh, there is this incident that takes place as these people arrive. Some commentators have noted that as Jesus exits Jerusalem, and goes out toward Gethsemane, crossing the Kidron Valley. He's following exactly the footsteps that King David took when he was being attacked by his ne'er-do-well son, Absalom. You recall that? And Jesus, or not Jesus, David is running for cover, you know, leaving uh, Jerusalem in that connection and those who were aligned with him. And some commentators have thought Jesus was doing the same thing. He was trying to run for cover. You know, the, the, the heat had gotten too hot and he was trying to escape. These are not the commentators that I tend to agree with, you understand, but the, uh, uh, the theory has been uh, floated. Well, I think it's safe to say 
that nothing in the narrative suggests that Jesus was trying to escape or hide out or avoid some kind of confrontation here whatsoever. Uh, Dale Bruner says the entire gospel has hinted at and contemplated the atoning work of Christ, which is now reported. John makes clear that Jesus puts Jerusalem on trial and Jesus is always in control. You know, John was alluding in the sermon this morning to the events that took place during Holy Week in which the people are celebrating Jesus entering Jerusalem, thinking he's their conquering hero, their king. But of course, things begin to go sideways because what becomes apparent is that part of what Jesus is doing in Holy Week is putting Jerusalem on trial. He's the judge. From a distance, it looks like Jesus is on trial, but close up, you realize, no, Jesus is putting them on trial. He reaches a verdict, guilty. He pronounces a sentence, destruction. He gives a judicial opinion in the form of various parables that he tells. All of that is the act of a judicial officer and indeed the kingly judicial officer here. And they don't like the verdict, you see. And that's part of what causes the events of the gospel to take place is their hostility. Rudolf Bultmann says, uh, the first scene reveals that the passion does not come upon Jesus as his fate. He's the one who acts and he controls the situation. So as we read this, and John doesn't want us to miss it, Jesus is running the show. All of these people are playing a role that has been orchestrated by him. And so nothing in this should make us feel like Jesus is somehow at loose ends or that this whole thing is a train wreck or anything of the sort. He wants to keep his disciples with him as long as possible, but at a certain point he will dismiss them by his own command, he will do that. Well, <clears throat> the place was well known. Judas, who betrayed him, knew the place. Jesus often met with his disciples there. Sorry for the uh, lack of a good Greek text there. But uh, that is the word uh, paradidus, it's from paradidomy, and it's the word translated betrayed, but it actually means more literally to hand over. And that is a little bit of a different idea. Judas is handing Jesus over to the religious leaders, and then the same word is used several more times. The religious leaders will hand Jesus over to Pilate, Pilate will hand Jesus over to the soldiers to mock him, abuse him, and ultimately crucify him. All of these handovers are taking place, in a sense, making it appear like Jesus is being victimized by the circumstances, and yet actually it's just the opposite. All of this, of course, has to take place. So this is the first of such incidents. Uh, Judas has pro procured a band of soldiers. These are Roman soldiers. The term that's used there would be applied to Roman military. And then in addition, some officers from the chief priests and Pharisees. So you have a little bit of a link between Rome and the Jewish religion, the Jewish religious leaders at this point, and they all go out there together. It's one of several evidences we have of Rome and the religious leadership in Jerusalem working in concert. While they don't have a lot in common, they have enough in common that they really have common cause, you see, in many cases. And of course, by the time the trial of Jesus is over, the connection between them is going to be solidified when the religious leaders, along with all of those aligned with them, stand up in front of Pilate and say, we have no king but Caesar. See, that is an absolute repudiation of their own heritage. No king but Caesar, not Yahweh, not this Jesus, no king but Caesar. And that, you might say, is their pronouncement of judgment against themselves, to repudiate their own heritage in such an explicit, point-blank fashion there in front of Pilate. Uh, there's no getting out of that, you see. That is really the, uh, that's the doom, really, of the old covenant system as it has now reached its final nadir, you might say, the final expression of treason 
against their covenant Lord. And we have a hint of it here as you have Rome along with these military types or temple guard from the religious leaders showing up at that point. It's kind of a evidence of a sellout, you might say, that finally reaches its culminating expression in these events. Dale Bruner throws in a little interesting side comment. He says it's interesting that these people are coming with lanterns and torches. And Dale says the lights of this world as they're hunting for the light of this world. You know, I thought that was kind of an interesting side point there that's worth mentioning. Well, Jesus knew what was going on. And so he steps forward. He's not discovered. He's not surprised. He wasn't hiding in the bushes, you know, hoping no one would detect him. He's the one who's in charge. He steps forward right in front of this whole crowd, this whole gathering, how many there may have been there, and asks the very innocent question, well, who are you guys looking for, you know? Whom do you seek? Who are you looking for? He takes the initiative, asks the question. It's not the only time that question is asked in John's Gospel. One other notable occasion is when Mary Magdalene is standing at the tomb, weeping, and through her tears she sees what appears to be the gardener off at a distance, and the gardener says to her, who are you looking for? And John probably does that intentionally because that question can be put to some people who might say, we're looking for Jesus of Nazareth to bury him, as these were. And some people might hear the same question and say they're looking for Jesus of Nazareth to worship him. Who are you looking for? Uh, of course, it's the deepest question we can ask ourselves, and we should always ask ourselves, every time we roll out of bed in the morning, I should ask myself, who am I really looking for in my life? What is, uh, you know, what's the heart of that which I desire in life? And somewhere out there in the answer, the face of Jesus should show up. Well, in this case, of course, they give that answer. They answered, uh, Jesus of Nazareth, and Jesus acknowledges in that weighty Old Testament name for God, Yahweh, ego eimi in the Greek Septuagint, ego eimi, Jesus of Nazareth. He's known by his hometown. And Dale notes once again, they were looking for Jesus of Nazareth, to wit, Jesus of Nowheresville, and he responds, ego a me, I am. The Jesus of nowhere, says Dale, is the God of everywhere. Nazareth, we've mentioned before, has no presence in the Old Testament. It exists, but there's no mention of it in the Old Testament anywhere. Um, Josephus, the most comprehensive historian of the Jewish people, giving extraordinary detail on many different areas that goes, you know, that are covered in the Old Testament, he goes into much greater detail on many of them, never mentions Nazareth once. It's a city we wouldn't even know existed, except that we've heard of Jesus of Nazareth. And that idea, I've, I've sometimes joked, but I think I get in trouble with some people when I say it's kind of like saying the great leader of the world came from Washtukna, you know, and you think, Washtukna. Now, if you're from Washtukna, all due respects, but you know, I come from Grand Coulee. It's the same kind of thing. Who would have, who would have thunk it? Jesus of Nazareth is the, this great character that's going to change the world. And that's kind of what's surprising about that in some ways. This is the first time we'll notice it that the word I am, ego eimi, is used in this text. And John notes for us just in passing that Judas, who betrayed them, was standing with them. And we read that in connection then with what it says, when Jesus said to them, ego eimi, they, including Judas, fell back or went back, drew back, and fell to the ground that even the betrayer here is swept away by the power of the presence of the majesty of Jesus. Now there's no intimation that Jesus is displaying his glory. This isn't the transfiguration, you know. There isn't some kind of epiphany of glory that's being poured out. Just the words 
are weighty enough. That's what happens when people are confronted with the majesty of Christ. The knee bows. In the prophecy of Isaiah in the Old Testament, the word knee, knee, like that part of your body, you know, is used one time. It's Isaiah 45, 23. One time. And in that text, Isaiah affirms that with respect to only one great being, every knee will bow. It's exclusively a term applied to Yahweh. Paul was quite aware of that when he said to the Philippians, every knee will bow before Christ. Because in Paul's mind, you cannot separate the Lord Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, from the God of the Old Testament and the Father who was affirmed by Isaiah as the true, the true and only God. And that is what they caught a glimpse of here. John, our author, will also say in chapter 1 of Revelation, when he hears a voice behind him, I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven gold lampstands, and among the lampstands was one like the Son of Man, having a robe reaching down to his feet, a crown, of, uh, 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 and his face was shining like the sun. A sword was coming out of his mouth. All of these amazing descriptive terms that John uses, and he says, he fell at his feet as though dead. You know, it wasn't like that was a conscious decision. Well, I guess I better fall down now. You know, he didn't have to think that through. This is just the reaction to a glimpse of the glory of Jesus. And that's what happens here. Every knee will bow. Some will bow in worship and reverence. Some will bow in a recognition that this God that they have despised, that they've used as a curse word, that they've disregarded, that they've treated with arrogant disrespect, is the God that now commands them to bow. And it's what happens here. These who are there to arrest him can't resist bowing before him. I might mention as well, <clears throat> that's the only power the church has, the only legitimate power. Uh, there is the capacity for the glory of God to be, to be communicated in the ministry of the church. Um, the church has at times had great power, military hardware, great wealth, great displays of this world's influence and so on. And for all of that, it cannot by that means alone, cause people to catch a glimpse of glory. Sometimes the church has been impoverished, persecuted, you know, harried from pillar to post, seeming as if it's on the very edge of extinction, and yet that same church, sometimes under very unusual circumstances, commands people to repent. And the glory shines through in those moments in ways that you could never see it in some great, you know, architectural display or something like that. Jesus at this point looked like the victim and yet even now his power shone forth and that's really in some ways the story of the church. Well, he asked them again, who are you seeking? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Same question, different tone of voice I'm assuming. Jesus said, well, I told you, ego a me. So, if you're looking for me, let these men go. That's a command. It's not a request. Would you please let them go? This is a command. They're not going to be able to resist it. This was to fulfill the word that had been spoken by Jesus only a few minutes earlier in the high priestly prayer. This was to fulfill that word, of those whom you gave me, I have lost not one. Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, put away your sword, dude. Shall I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? Interesting, isn't it? Reference to the cup. 
Jesus, of course, had prominently referred to the cup. The synoptics tell us earlier when he said, let this cup pass from me. You know, remember that. John doesn't mention that, but he does mention this, the cup. Jesus is submitting to the Father's will. He will drink this cup, and he must drink it. And Peter's not doing anything to facilitate the process by flailing a sword around in the situation. So, same words, different tune, but one thing is clear, Jesus is now firmly in the driver's seat of these events. So, commanding them, not requesting, if you're seeking me, let these men go, Jesus has to go through this gauntlet alone. It's very important, there's a theological point hanging in this that we always need to keep in mind. Jesus could not go through the events that are now lying before him with anybody's help. There are theologies to this day in the world that want to say we help Jesus out. His atonement really accomplished by far most of what was necessary for our salvation, but we still need to contribute something. There's still a little bit of congruous merit, as sometimes called, a little added work we can do to sort of supplement and round out, you know, Jesus' efforts for us. And that, of course, is not a version of the gospel. It's a denial of the gospel. The gospel says we were helpless, bankrupt, utterly, utterly unable to do anything for ourselves. And the only hope we had was if Jesus paid 100% of the price. Not 99%, you know, not most of it, all of it. And thus the price tag for our receipt of that benefit is to acknowledge that we didn't do anything to deserve it or earn it or merit it. We get it as grace, pure, unmitigated, absolute grace. And so Jesus has to go through this alone. The disciples cannot help out. They can't carry him along, encourage him, pat him on the back, you know. Can't do any of it. None of it is appropriate. John says this was to fulfill the word that had been spoken. Of those you gave me, I have lost none. Now that phrase or that formula, this was to fulfill the word is what John normally will say with respect to the Old Testament. If he's quoting a scripture, something of weight from a prophet, for example, he will say, this was to fulfill the word spoken, you know, so and so. Here he uses that very formula, but applies it to something Jesus said just a few minutes earlier in the high priestly prayer. And he hopes we don't miss the point when Jesus speaks, it is the word of God. And so what Jesus says, is as much inevitably to be fulfilled as if Isaiah said and everybody else. This is the word of God among us. And John wants to remind us of that. So this is fulfilling the word spoken by Jesus. Of those you gave me, I've lost none. And that, of course, is going to be a reminder that Jesus is fully controlling all that takes place here. He has to let the disciples go in any event because their time to step up to the plate for Jesus is coming for sure. The day of Pentecost and so on. But at this point, they're still not quite ready for that. They need to leave the situation, let Jesus do what only he can do. But their role is going to certainly come along soon enough. So John Calvin says, Christ continually bears with our weakness. When he puts himself forward to repel so many attacks of Satan and wicked men, because he sees that we are not yet able or prepared for them. In short, he never brings his people into the field of battle until they have been fully trained so that in perishing they do not perish, because there's gain provided for them both in death and in life. There's a preparation. You know, God never tests us beyond what we're able. But hopefully as we grow in faith, we are able by God's grace to withstand greater tests. And in some ways, these disciples, so they've been with Jesus all this time, are not quite ready for the test anyway. So they need to be exited from the situation. And so here's John quoting Jesus as scripture, 
launching, of course, all the things that Jesus had predicted in connection with this. John alone tells us that it was Peter who wielded the sword and Malchus was the servant who was injured. Uh, John gives us those two personal names. The synoptics mention this incident, but they don't give us the personal names in either case. So Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So we have two named characters here. One is warrior Peter. Peter had promised, I'm willing to die for you. Heroic Peter, he's making good on his promises, you know. And he pulls out a sword and he's ready to run into this overwhelming crowd of people with all of their weapons and so on and figuring this is probably a suicide mission, but I said I was going to do it. I'm going to do it. He's got a head of steam. He's just kind of worked himself up into this hot passion and grabs his sword and starts flailing it around. And of course, in the process, chops off a guy's ear. <sighs> Dietrich Bonhoeffer was hung, you know, by the Nazis. Not long before he was hung, he wrote what's called letters and papers from prison. And in one of those, he says the following, the fanatic thinks that his single-minded principles qualify him to do battle with the powers of evil. But like a bull, he rushes at the red cloak instead of at the person who's holding it. He exhausts himself and is beaten. He gets tangled in non-essentials and falls into the trap set by cleverer people. But, you know, that really does describe uh, Peter for sure. I'm sure it describes me at some times in my life. We kind of get ahead of steam going and we think we're doing something, you know, that will honor Jesus and he'll be really happy with it, not realizing that we're just about as mindless as that bull chasing a red cape, and uh, it seldom works out well and often works out poorly. As a general rule in church history, the church has on occasion pulled out a sword to try to go after the enemies of the church, and in so doing has, in a metaphorical sense, chopped off the ears of the people that should have been their mission field. When the church goes after people with a sword, they tend to become deaf to the gospel, don't they? It tends to reduce people to a kind of bitter hostility to the church. I mean, how many times have I had conversations, and you have too, with people, and you wanna tell them about the truth of Jesus, and the first thing they raise is the Crusades. Well, it's you Christians who did the Crusades. They still have lacked their ears because of something we did a thousand years ago, you know. Now, I don't take a whole lot of ownership of the Crusades, I grant you that, but it, the very fact that it happened at all, in any minuscule sense, in the name of Jesus, has caused that to continue down through this, to this day, that people still use that as an excuse not to come to faith in Christ because, sorry, you chopped off my ears. It just doesn't work out right. You know, we need to be very cautious about trying to coerce, extort, or otherwise influence in an unfair way the attitudes of others, even if we think it's for the sake of Christ. The warrior Peter is contrasted here with the healer Jesus who gives the man back his ear. That's probably what saved Peter from being arrested. You know, he, he had just committed a bit of a violent crime himself there and very well could have been cuffed right along with Jesus. But Jesus stops Peter, heals the man. Church history tells us that Malchus, and by, that's probably the reason John gave the name, eventually became a believer, maybe on the spot, but certainly eventually, and became a well-known personality in the church, the early church of that day. Uh, that may be the case. I rather think it's probably true. Sometimes these very early non-biblical strands, you, you have to hold them with a little bit of, you know, caution, but nevertheless, I think there may be some truth to it. Anyway, the name is known to us, and it's very likely this will be a character we might run into uh, in eternity. Well, Jesus continues, 
Put your sword in its sheath. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? The cup concerning which Jesus had already prayed. As I say, probably this rebuke avoid, avoided Peter being arrested. Now, it's a very interesting, kind of a subtle point. Jesus doesn't say to Peter, throw your sword away, but he does literally say, throw it back in its sheath. It's a strong word, ekbaloth, put it back in the sheath. You know, it's, it's stronger than you might expect. If he said, throw it away, some people might make a case for absolute pacifism. Uh, and some of, uh, of course, embrace that. But the New Testament contemplates there is a proper place for the sword. There is a proper place for legitimate authority that has coercive power. Paul says, Romans 13, the civil magistrate doesn't bear the sword for nothing. The Old Testament is filled with what we commonly call just wars. But the difference here is when we're acting on behalf of the kingdom, you know, when we're acting on behalf of Christ, not simply political conflicts that may occur occasionally, but acting specifically on behalf of the kingdom, there's no really place for the sword except for the sword that comes out of the mouth of the rider on the horse. That sword, the word of God, is our only legitimate weapon. It's a potent weapon. We don't have to apologize for it. We just need to realize that in the business of conducting God's work in this world, that's the weapon that works. The others will tend to chop people's ears off. This weapon will tend to give them ears to hear and eyes to see and draw them to Christ. And so sometimes I know the church at times has wanted to sort of exert its political muscle or military muscle. We've got those chapters in history. And this is a caution to us about that. So the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. Put your hands behind your back, you know, tied him up. First, they led him to Annas. He was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. That fateful year is the former. It's not like it was a rotating office, but that was the year that Caiaphas held the office visibly. Annas was still power behind the scenes. It was Caiaphas who had advised the Jews that it would be expedient for one man to die for the people. So Jesus is cuffed, but only because he permitted it. You know, it's very important. Put your hands behind him. Jesus accommodates. The handcuffs are put on him. He's led away. You know, this man who stood out there in a little boat in the middle of the Sea of Galilee as it was being assaulted by an unbelievable storm that was scaring these disciples to death. Jesus wakes up, stretches, he's been napping, you know, in the middle of this, says the Greek words, siopa, pifomoso, which come into English roughly as, quiet down, shut up, says that to the storm. Bam! Silent. Don't you think he could have walked away from those cuffs? You know, this was not an effective constraint, except because he allowed it. You know, just like Samson was bound up with new ropes, he just broke them with the Spirit of God on him. Jesus could have done But no, Jesus is submitting because, and this has been pointed out more than once, Jesus, in a sense, is behaving just like Isaac, the son of Abraham, had behaved way back in Genesis 22. Isaac was a young teenage fellow. His father Abraham was elderly. If Isaac had wanted to resist his father, he certainly could have. As Abraham says, okay, son, I'm going to tie you up and put you on the altar and I'm gonna plunge a knife into you and offer you as a burnt offering. I'm sure Isaac was a little startled to hear that. But it wasn't like he put up a fuss, at least that we know of. He submitted, and as you know, at the critical moment, God stayed the hand of Abraham. Abraham, don't lay your hand against the boy. Now I know you fear me. You know. The only difference is in the case of Jesus, the son, who submits to being bound up and laid on an altar, nobody stays the hand of God because it was God 
who's pouring it. This is not the wrath of man. This isn't the wrath of the Romans. It's not the wrath of anybody. It's the wrath of the Father being poured out against the Son because he loved you and me that much. It's just a staggering thought. And so Jesus willingly submits. Nothing forces him to it. He willingly submits as the sovereign God to this extraordinary set of events. Well, they led him first to Annas. He's the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. Many people in Israel regarded Annas as the true high priest because it was a lifelong appointment. And so it was kind of like, well, sort of like being the Pope or something. The idea, you know, was that you would, you would hold that office till you died, and normally that's the way it works. So Annas was thought by many to be the true high priest, but because the high priest had become so political and Rome exercised so much control, they had actually deposed Annas. He'd said some things that were not very PC with respect to the Romans, and so they deposed him. And from that point on, the house of Annas continued to rule, but Annas himself was kind of in a back shadowy status. He's still pulling the strings. He's still really kind of running the overall dynasty of his house, but it's others who are playing the role. So he had five sons. All of those sons held the office of high priest over the next several decades, and he had one son-in-law, Caiaphas, who happened to be holding the office at the moment that these things are happening. The house of Annas ruled in Jerusalem until 66 AD, which is when the Jewish revolt broke out and the zealots essentially took over political rule of Jerusalem. And in that connection, of course, things changed. Uh, so it was under the rule of the house of Annas that all of the martyrs who died in Jerusalem had paid for their faith with their blood. The book of Revelation says in chapter 5 that the the blood of the martyrs was pooling under the, the altar of sacrifice in the temple area. The temple's still standing, of course. So from God's point of view, when Stephen was killed by being stoned, when James was beheaded, when people who died under the watch of Saul of Tarsus, and there were some, Paul admits it, when there were others who died paying for their faith with their lives, their blood was seen from God's point of view as pooling under the altar. That's why Revelation 5 says, they cried out, how long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the land and avenge our blood, you know, because they're waiting for that and they're told it won't be much longer. All of that happens under the house of Annas. So he's really playing a role that is pretty hostile, as you can well imagine, to the Christian movement. Uh, it was Caiaphas, John reminds us, who had advised the Jews that it would be expedient that one man should die for the people. Uh, to make his identity unmistakable, we don't have any uh, confusion in our minds about who this was. This is, of course, the man who is going to preside over the trial, such as it was, of Jesus. He's going to ask the question, are you the son of the blessed? This is Caiaphas who cross-examines Jesus. And of course extorts, as he sees it, from Jesus a confession that qualifies as blasphemy so that he can then say, okay, it's appropriate to execute this guy. Uh, let's get it done before breakfast. You know, that's kind of the, the, the spirit of what's going on there. Simon Peter followed Jesus and so did another disciple, John. Since that disciple, John, was known to the high priest he entered with Jesus into the court of the high priest. The architecture was a horse-shaped building with an open courtyard out in the middle. You probably know that. There was a fire there. People would be out there. They're outside, but they're within the precincts, you might say, of the home. And then there was an iron gate that sort of blocked free access to it. And a servant would be posted there to give access to those who were who qualified to gain entrance. So that's kind of the arrangement. John gains access. He's known. Apparently the servant girl even recognized him, so he gains access. The other disciple, uh, John, who was known to the high priest, went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept watch at the door and brought Peter in. So John goes in, and then he goes back, 
has a little conversation with this probably late teenage servant, her of no great importance, you know, in the staff of Annas, and Peter's allowed in on that basis. The servant girl at the door said to Peter, well, are you also, you're not also one of these man's disciples, are you? Some people think that means she recognized Peter, probably not. Probably what it means is she recognized Peter was with John and she knew that John was a disciple of Jesus. And so she's asking, are you also a disciple? But she phrases it grammatically expecting a negative answer. Well, you're not, you're not also one of this man's disciples, are you? You know, very easy to answer in the negative because the, the question is framed expecting a negative answer. And so Peter, accommodates, no, no, not me. Now the servants and the officers had made a charcoal fire because it was cold and they were standing and warming themselves and Peter also was with them standing and warming himself. This is Peter's first denial. He didn't know it. It was so innocuous, so incidental. He was still waiting for his moment, you know. But this was, this was that critical first denial, and of course we know later it all snowballed from there. So following at a distance, Jesus being hauled away to the home of Annas, John is well known. The family of John is well known. Not sure why. Dale has an interesting speculation here. In spite of being given freedom to flee, John and Peter follow close behind, and John actually enters with Jesus into the courtyard. He can speak, John can, as an eyewitness and gives evidence of that status more than once. Now, Dale asks, how is it that the family of John is known? Well, that's speculation. We don't know for sure. But it may be, Dale speculates, and many others with him, by the way, this is kind of a common view, that it may be that the family of Zebedee was wealthy and that he ran his fishing business out of Jerusalem. John was a son of Zebedee, as you know, and James. And it may very well be that Zebedee was a quite successful businessman, that he didn't run his shop out in Galilee, that he actually operated from Jerusalem and had employees out there who were running kind of the hands-on operation. That's, that's fairly probable. And given the revenue that flowed in to the priestly family, they tended to hobnob only with other very wealthy people in Jerusalem. And so it could very well be that up until this time, Zebedee, who was a wealthy man probably, and others like him, were on a first name basis with the priestly family because they hung out together. They had this kind of cordial uh, relationship. And uh, that's the speculation. I can't say that that's what the Bible teaches at all, but that's at least one plausible explanation for the fact that John is known. Peter, on the other hand, lives in Galilee. He's not known by anybody. He's really, you know, from the outback there. And uh, so he is admitted based on, you might say, John's good looks. The other disciple who was known to the high priest went out and spoke to the servant girl who kept watch at the door, brought Peter in. So John is admitted on his own recognizance. He gains admission for Peter. And the servant girl is asking a fairly innocent question here. There's no threat to it. It's not like, I caught you, you know, something like that, like a trap. It's almost like small talk. Well, you're not also one of this man's disciples, are you? Meaning John is, he's known to be that. Peter, you know, we don't know what his status is, so she asked the question, and, and the question is so innocent that it's very easy for Peter to give to this kind of easy denial. No, no, not me. You know. At this point, he doesn't think about the fact that Jesus had predicted this. It's so, it's so, tiny, so incidental. Who'd have thought? I just, I, I have to say, as I've reflected on this, I've thought, how many times in my life have I just done something that just didn't seem all that bad in the moment? You know, just some little tiny, subtle thing. No big deal. I mean, really, come on. You know, we think, well, when the real test comes, there, I'm there. You know, but right, this is nothing. This is no, that's, that's all it takes. The old story of the camel with the nose in the tent, it's kind of that, and that's, that seems to be what's going on here with, with Peter. <clears throat> Dale Bruner says, uh, Peter was looking for a bigger moment. He's gonna be a hero, he's still gonna be a hero. 
The first time hadn't worked out, but he's still got his sword and he's still ready to mix it up. He was looking for a bigger moment, didn't want to be waylaid by this nothing servant girl. Come on, I should, I'm not going to have this contest here with you. Come on. You know, Peter may have thought that to distance himself from the followers was not actually denying Christ, but Dale says insightfully, it really was. We may avoid identifying with the church, but by so doing, we also deny Christ. You know. Peter's uk a me, I am not, stands in contrast to Jesus' ego a me, I am. And those two seem to be playing against each other. Well, last verse we're going to cover this morning, the servants and officers had made a charcoal fire. Because it was cold, and they were standing and warming themselves, and Peter also was with them, standing and warming himself. The Romans are gone. These are now simply Jewish authorities. At this very moment, Jesus is in front of Annas. We don't hear a whole lot about that private conversation, kind of a little arraignment that's happening there with Annas. Um, Peter is outside, thinking he's concealing his identity until the uh, appropriate moment. And I know... You're all wondering, how does this story end? Well, boys and girls, did I tell you, I don't think I mentioned this earlier. Did I say, did I tell them about how many weeks we're going to have off? Did? Okay, I, oh, I think I did. Okay, just so, just so the record's clear. We don't meet next week, Easter. We don't meet the week after that because Candy and I are in Tucson. We don't meet the week after that because it's a gathering Sunday, so the next time we meet is April 21st. It's one, week, one month out. It gives me a lot of time to prepare. Uh, so I hope you remember this class is actually happening a month from now and find your way back. I'd really appreciate that. But uh, even at that, we're going to finish um, uh, our studies of John this year if, I, if I'm a good boy and uh, uh, keep this on track. So anyway, that's the plan. Anyway, if you're wondering how it ends, you're going to have to come back in a month. And uh, we'll, we'll let you know. It's all kind of hanging there in the balance right now. But to wrap things up this morning, there is a majesty in Christ that does not depend on displays of earthly wealth, power, or beauty. And that majesty shines through our clay pot. I don't mind wealth, power, or beauty. I love our sanctuary. And you know, in terms of many sanctuaries, it's a pretty nice place. There are cathedrals in the world, as you know, that would greatly exceed what we have here. And there are much more modest or but the authority, the power of our church or any church is not a function of our stained glass windows, you know, any of those things that are kind of the human accoutrements. Uh, it depends on Jesus. Jesus and his majesty is what carries the freight. And that's why what, uh, that's why what Paul says to the Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, we carry this treasure the treasure of the glory of Jesus in a cracked pot. I don't know about you, I am a cracked pot. Really cracked, more than most of you know. I am a cracked pot. But the nice thing about a crack is that sometimes a little light from the inside shines through, you know. And that's the way we need to view it. None of us are going to win people for Christ because of our good looks, our eloquence, our this, our that. It doesn't happen that way. It is Jesus who draws people to himself. And Jesus travels around this world through a bunch of cracked pots like us. So let's never apologize for the treasure we carry within us, nor get too proud of the cracks in the pot that carries him along. Let's keep our priorities focused where they really belong. There is a satisfaction in Christ that doesn't depend on the tinsel of earthly wealth, power, or beauty, but that meets the deepest longings of the human heart. 
Jesus asked the question twice in John's gospel, who are you looking for? Once to some people who have clubs and swords and the equipment to arrest someone, put them in chains. He asked that question to them and he also asked it to Mary Magdalene. You know. Jesus is satisfied, true satisfaction for either one of them, but some repudiate him. They want to tie him down, put him in chains, get rid of him, bury him, make him extinct. Some people see him as the deepest and most satisfying thing they could possibly imagine. And we, of course, have to ask that question. I assume being here, tolerating a lecture like this, you are seeking Jesus because you know that in him is satisfaction. Well, that's good. Let's all keep pressing that we can know him uh, because that is, of course, a satisfaction that exceeds any amount of money or wealth or other benefits this world may bestow upon us. There is a strength in Christ that does not depend on the weaponry of earthly wealth, power, or beauty, but that pushes back the very gates of hell. The strength of Christ is not in the swords of this world, but it is in the sword that uh, comes out of the mouth of the rider on the horse, the sword of Jesus and the spirit of his word that is part of our great treasure. And so that's where we can rejoice and it's there that we find the greatest power we could possibly wield in this world on his behalf, his word. And I'm done and I'd appreciate any thoughts you may have as we wrap this up. Thanks for being here, by the way. Always great to see you. Keith. Yeah, probably not. Okay. Yeah, Keith's question is the, this band of people that came, especially those acting on behalf of the religious leaders, didn't apparently include any of those religious leaders, members of the Sanhedrin. So don't know that for sure. The scripture doesn't tell us, but the implication is that these were what are called temple guard, and the temple guard would simply be kind of low-level security officers who were appointed to, you know, make sure that the temple was treated properly and uh, to, you know, kick out people that were misbehaving, that sort of thing. That seems to be who they were. They do have backup from Roman presence, uh, but I think, the, I think your question is probably correct, that, that at least nothing in the text would suggest that these were people who were actually members of the Sanhedrin. They were just sent out to grab Jesus, bring him in, let's get rid of this guy while we can, and uh, that'll be that. Okay, yeah. So Keith's point is uh, interesting, isn't it, that uh, it's these fellows who have come out to arrest Jesus <clears throat> who are the ones who, are, who drew back and fell down when Jesus says, ego a me. Whereas in the trial of Jesus, which is going to take place in the next couple hours, Caiaphas and others are going to be looking at the same Jesus. We don't hear about them falling down and worshiping. Maybe these guys in this, uh, uh, this kind of uh, posse that have been sent out to, uh, to arrest Jesus, maybe they got it, maybe at that point. Interesting hypothesis. I haven't uh, heard that or seen it, but I like it. So I'm going to think about that. Thanks, Keith. Very good. Excuse me? They were sent out by them. Yeah. But we don't know what the disposition of their heart was. They were just functionaries doing a job, you know. You had a question over here, didn't you? Right. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So good, good thought. I hadn't thought about that, but that's an excellent uh, parallel there. The, the, uh, the origins of a king in Israel happened back under Sam, Samuel, when the people said, we want a king like the other nations, you know, and Samuel grudgingly kind of caves in and with God's authority, they get their first king. Uh, and now they've reached the end of the line. And and now I'm not, maybe this is the point you're making, but it's almost like they're getting what they asked for in the first place. They're getting exactly the king like the other nations have. That's, that's a pretty good point. Thank you. I appreciate that. Excellent. Yeah. Anyway, I'm going once, going twice. Anybody else? Thank you all. for. Well, we'll see you in a month. Thanks for being here. I appreciate it very much. Hope you have a glorious Easter. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Hey, let's, uh, let's close in prayer. Our Father, we are deeply grateful that these events took place. As much anguish as they produced in the moment, and certainly anguish we would have shared as well. 
We know that it was because God loved the world that he sent his son so that we who have put our faith in him would not perish but have everlasting life. We rejoice in that. We rejoice in an opportunity to review these great events. Ask your blessing now as we go our various ways that all that we do would be in honor of this one that we love and serve, the Lord Jesus Christ.